I would first of all like to thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for uh, giving us the opportunity to conduct this study. Um, I certainly would like to thank my co-principal investigator, Dung Su, and our fantastic team. I also thank God that I have some interesting findings to share with you today. <laughs> Um, this was a challenging study to conduct, and uh, we're pleased uh, with the results. We, we, we hope that, that you find them interesting as well. Um, you know the problem as well as I do. Uh, the IOM estimates that in hospitals, patients experience uh, on average one medication error per day. We know that medication errors kill 7,000 patients per year, that they're expensive, and that there is wide variation in the rate of medication errors per 1,000 patient days across hospitals. Previous research by Lucian Leap and his colleagues did show that um, medication errors, regardless of points of origin, um, his research showed that 50% of all of these medication errors are actually intercepted before they reach the patient, fortunately. And of those 50% that are intercepted, 86% are intercepted by nurses. So at the core of our question was what do nurses do? What are the care processes in which nurses engage to catch those medication errors, to intercept those errors before they reach the patient? And then what are the factors that influence nurses' ability um, to engage in this important work? And last but not least, phase three, what are the costs associated with med errors? We have estimates of the costs of ADEs, but as has been mentioned before, not all ADEs result in errors. So to begin to make a business case, we don't want to overinflate um, the cost of medication errors. So we want to get out, begin to get perhaps a more accurate cost estimate. In phase one, uh, we conducted uh, qualitative interviews with 50 uh, staff nurses working on med surge units across 10 hospitals, and just simply asked them, what do you do? What are the processes in which you use to catch medication errors? We then used their responses and, and subjected them to qualitative analysis, identified seven main themes, which I'll talk about in a minute, and constructed a nursing medication safety process scale, which we then embedded in phase two, which was the quantitative phase of the study. Our sample was 83 medical surgical units as licensed by the state across 14 hospitals. The hospitals ranged in size from small community hospitals with 176 beds to large academic medical centers with 586 beds. Our data sources started with the qualitative interviews. Then we embedded the medication safety process scale and Eileen Lake's um, practice environment scale into a nursing survey. Uh, um, I went to uh, all uh, 83 medical surgical units on a scheduled 14-hour day of uh, data collection for each one of them. My primary target were nurses that worked 7A to 7P, but stayed into the night shift as well in order to invite any nurses who worked on nights to participate if they so choose. Um, I was aiming for a 100% response rate of the nurses that were there in each of the 88 units, or I'm sorry, 83 units, and my average response rate was in fact 96%. Um, there were, yeah, I know, uh, again, thank you, God. Um, there was uh, an average of eight nurses um, participating per unit, so we think that we got a pretty good representation in order to aggregate these measures to the unit level. The pharmacist survey used the medication penetration scale, a very simple scale in which pharmacists are asked to indicate whether or not a list of medication safety devices are implemented on the units. So one was completed for each unit, indicating whether the strategy was not implemented at all, partially implemented, or fully implemented, and that was a 100% response rate. And then administrative data were collected every month um, over an eight-month period for the 83 med surge units. And that included RN hours per patient day by unit and, I'm sorry to say, yes, documented med errors per 1,000 patient days. Um, the measure of med errors were those med errors that were actually reported via the formal hospital reporting system. Our measures, um, um, I just basically described, and let me say that there was quite a bit of variation in the measures across units. 
All data, again, were aggregated to the unit level, and so we use these robust procedures like HLM and GEE to account for clustering when we tested the models. So what did we find? Well, let's start with the, the qualitative findings. Um, what did nurses say uh, with respect to what do they do to keep patients safe and intercept these medication errors? There were seven main categories, and I won't focus on all seven. I'll just focus on the four that together were statistically associated with fewer med medication errors. And it starts with um, nurses described very proactive, higher level critical thinking, where they questioned for each medication before they gave it, why is this medication ordered? What is the underlying condi condition or disease process? Has that disease process or condition changed? If this medication was appropriate for the patient yesterday, is it still appropriate for the patient today? And then engage the physician, calling the physician or discussing with, it if they, with the physician if they had a question. I just want to point out that what these nurses described is the exact opposite of um, what Dr. Brooke mentioned yesterday when he talked about some cultures in which nurses are so intimidated that they're afraid, they're actually afraid to contact the doctor or, or ask a question. The nurses also identified, or many of them did, that the, actually the patients and families were the last line of defense against a medication error. So they proactively made sure that patients and families knew what the patient was getting, what they looked like, what it was for, so they could identify an error before they actually took the med. They also very proactively asked MDs to simply rewrite orders that they couldn't read or where improper abbreviations were used. And a group of these nurses went above and beyond and described a process where at the beginning of their shift, they actually took their medic medication administration record and traced each medication back to the original order to make sure that it wasn't transcribed improperly and that, that it reflected what was actually ordered. This is a process in these hospitals that was actually allocated to the nurses who work on the night shift to do. But the day shift nurses, many of them um, went a step above and beyond and conducted their own, what we call MAR reconciliation. These cluster of four activities were really important because as you can see, they were associated in the expected direction with fewer um, um, non-intercepted medication errors. The unadjusted estimate with controlling for nothing um, in, in, in the study was very, very closely approached to statistical significance at 0.0506. And when we adjusted for technology, specifically CPOE, because that was the other significant predictor, it was in fact statistically significant. So there was an association between what nurses did and or the percentage or the degree to which nurses engaged in these activities and fewer medication errors. Let me also say there was variation. Not all nurses engaged in these activities. There were certain predictors, however, that identified or that enhanced nurses' ability or their willingness to engage in this sort of patient advocacy. And those were, not surprisingly, all five subscales of the nursing practice environment, all five subscales. And to a smaller degree, but still significant, are in hours per patient day. So the bottom line is when nurses work in an environment where there is indeed collaborative relationships with physicians, where they do indeed have input into policies and procedures on their unit, when they have a supportive manager who will back up the nurse, even when they're in conflict with the physician, and when there's foundations for quality, such as a good orientation, a preceptorship, ongoing education, these, these cultural attributes do indeed in this study enhance nurses' willingness or ability or the frequency with which they engage in these higher order medication safety processes. So these findings, um, very interestingly, are totally congruent with Linda Aiken's model of nursing organizations and outcomes, where she proposes that staffing as well as the nurse working work environment, these five pillars, if you will, impact processes of care. In this study, medication safety processes and that it is these processes of care that influence patient outcomes. And in this study, that was med errors per 1,000 patient days. We also learned that technology is our friend. CPOE was significantly associated with fewer um, non-intercepted um, non medication errors. Uh, electronic medical record in and of itself was not. Barcoding in and of itself was not. 
but even partial implementation of CPOE was significantly associated with fewer medication errors. 